So we found uh, numerous advantages using OptiFlow for uh, awake fiber optic intubation technique. The high flow uh, oxygen helps uh, open up the airway, which is an advantage in that it reduces uh, uh, contact with, with, the, with the soft tissue and therefore helps reduce uh, the effect of bleeding and secretions. Uh, it helped with the uh, spreading of the local anesthetic uh, throughout the upper airway. The high flow also helps uh, eliminate uh, CO2. If the patient became over sedated and apneic, we found that they didn't desaturate and almost all the patients found the OptiFlow comfortable during the procedure. Close your eyes for a second, just like pop it over your, over your nose. How's that? Is that okay? That's okay. Yeah. Okay, how are you finding the, uh, the oxygen? Is that okay? Yeah, it's yeah, it's not too no, uncomfortable? No, it's no. Okay. okay, good. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to start to give you some of the sedation now. Okay. So, it's okay, isn't it? It's fine. Big breaths in and out. Centralize it. That's it. Go on to the left hand. So what we have found is actually this is the only technique currently available to us where we are able to deliver 100% oxygen continuously throughout an awake for optic intubation and safely intubate the patient. No other technique out there allows us to do that. Hello, welcome back to SAS21. Uh, as you can see, by, I've been joined by a panel now, um, so I'd like to introduce you to Louise Ellard, who's an anaesthetist, Nikki Mills, who's an ENT surgeon, David Brewster, who's an anaesthetist intensivist, and Chris Greenbridge, who's an emergency physician. Right. So we're gonna be talking about procedural airway skills. So considering the complexities of our times, how do we best approach acquisition and maintenance of these complex airway skills? In this session, we're going to explore the teaching of procedural skills to novices, to trainees, and also to experienced clinicians. We're going to cover core and specialized airway skills and how we introduce new techniques to, techniques to experienced practitioners. So as a panel, we've identified some kind of generic problems with this. Novices and trainees often learn on real patients. Is that acceptable? Teaching of new skills can be a bit disorganized and ad hoc. Um, and we're also going to ask the question, how does that experienced clinician learn a new skill? And we're going to use the example of hyperangulated video laryngoscopy to have a little look at that. So the solutions that we've kind of come up with as a group, we really want to press the scaffolded learning approach. Now, you may not have heard of the scaffolded learning approach, but what that is, is to break down skills into component parts and teach those components individually and then build up learning as you go through. That makes it man more manageable for learners. We're going to also be talking to you about a kind of seven step approach to teaching a skill, um, which I kind of alluded to in my talk. Um, I think we've got a slide on that, but the stages really are, first off, we've got to empathize with learners, you know, doing things like tracheal intubation as a novice, that's stressful. We're going to have a little look at, at how stressful that is and, and some strategies to overcome that. You need to analyze the skills that you're teaching and break them down into smaller parts. So bite size them. You need to familiarize your learners with the equipment they're going to be using, the anatomy they're going to be confronted with, and some basic principles. What's really important is supervised practice. It's not enough just to let them loose. You have to supervise them and give immediate feedback. We need to standardize the equipment that we're using, and we need to get organized. So we need to organize our equipment, our personnel, and our training opportunities for our learners. And that's how you become turn from an expert clinician to an expert clinician educator. So um, an example of um, analyzing a skill, which uh, I alluded to in my talk, is, is curve theory, two curve theory. 
uh, you know, where the, uh, the airway has been broken down into two curves. And that basic principle can really help us understand the anatomy of the airway and why hyperangulated video, video laryngoscopy can be a challenge. So I put together a little bit of a video, which I think we're going to sh show up. I'm wearing today, which is a little bit embarrassing. Um, but the aim of this technique is to deconstruct um, um, the, the skill and to try and teach curve theory in a non-threatening way. So remove the equipment, remove the patient, remove the mannequin, and just make the whole concept of two curve theory less threatening by just using something as simple as an artist's curve ruler. So that's just an example of a teaching technique uh, that we can use. But over to the panel now, that's enough from me. So I'm going to go to Nikki first. Nikki, um, you developed uh, a pediatric airway skills boot camp for your ENT trainees. Um, watching your presentation, it seems like you've applied a lot of those seven steps to the design of your course. Can you talk us through how you approach the design of the course with reference to teaching those individual really tricky skills? Um, so the, the course that I developed was based on um, trying to fill a need, I guess, for junior um, ENT registrars who had no skills or experience but were starting to be called for those emergencies without any training. So it was really just to give them the opportunity to learn what the equipment's about and have some skills training before they, as, as you mentioned in your talk, the need to have some skill development before you actually can do, do things to patients. So um, it, it was initially developed really to try and fill a gap, to have some hands-on um, opportunity to, to learn the equipment and how to hold it and use it. Um, it. It was developed initially really for very novice registrars, but eventually we did expand it and include development and coaching of skills for advanced trainees. And we have run the course now a few times for consultant um, surgeons as well who want to brush up on their skills. Um, and we developed the, that part of the course first and the afternoon part of the course is putting that together for the team's training, which I know is more um, in the next session, but it was kind of understanding that you have to have those basic skills before you can start to work as a team. Yeah, you had an, I mean, you had an incredible level of supervision in that course. The ratio of instructors to, to candidates was like two to one, wasn't it? Yeah, I, and I think I, I stuck very strongly to that. Um, and I think the reason for that was, I, I think if you are standing and watching, you don't have the same learning opportunity as if you have the equipment in your hands and understand that proprioceptive stuff around holding it and balancing it and being coordinated with it. So I think um, I resisted the temptation to have um, more participants because I think it, it gave a much better experience for learning to be able to actually have that one-on-one -on -one teaching opportunity and, and not be just standing watching. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it looks like a fantastic course. You've also got some great kind of technology in there um, with some a 3D micro laryngoscopy model that somebody made. And, uh, yeah, we, we had a, a, it's a huge range of um, kit really that I developed um, and borrowed and all sorts of things <laughs> for the different yeah. skills. And I, I guess it was really thinking about what the skills, specific skills were that you were wanting them to develop and how you would best give them a simulated um, opportunity to practice those skills. So for example, um, not specifically airway, but we had a mannequin that we developed for epistaxis that we had catheters could make the, the mannequin bleed anteriorly and posteriorly at uh, whim of the instructor. So, um, you know, it's it's the difference, the, the specific skills that you want them to develop in thinking about what um, equipment will best give them that opportunity. Yeah, making a course like that can really bring out your creative side, can't it? With uh, Yeah, <laughs> <that you> have... <laughs> my, my surgical model developed, evolved over 10 years to be quite yeah. a complex, um, a uh, combination of a swimming pool noodle, uh, sheep larynx, some pig skin, and a wooden board to kind of staple things on. And it worked really well, but it was a funny kind of evolution of 
<laughs> how to develop what I thought was the best model for that. Yeah, it's brilliant and often done on a shoestring budget as well. Um, the other thing that impressed me about the course was that it was into professional. You had paediatric anaesthetists coming along as well. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think and I'm sure everyone that's here feels the same way that um, airway management is a team sport. You know, we we cannot rely on one set of um, professional skills to provide everything that we need to look after these patients. and. I think it's really important, for example, one of the skill stations is difficult intubation. And so I always have anaesthetists and paediatric ENT surgeons running that station because I think it, we have different skills and approaches to different problems in that area and we can um, complement each other and work together. But we do think about things in a different way. So I think I have um, intensive care consultants, emergency um, consultants, um, some allied health people, um, and anaesthetists and ENT surgeons. And I think it's really important that the teaching is from those different viewpoints. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. The great course. So, so um, when I think of stressful things to do, I reckon paediatric ENT emergencies would be quite stressful. But so, Chris, um, we've got to empathise with that kind of level of stress, haven't we? Um, especially when we're on the learning curve. So you're doing a PhD in the impact of stress on performance in clinicians. What, so what can we do to mitigate those stress responses that airway operators get, especially when they're on the learning curve? Thank, thanks, Jonathan. I think you're right. I think it, it is stressful. And in my setting as well, in the emergency department, it's quite stressful intubating patients, and not just for novices, for the occasional intubator. It can be stressful as well. And I think actually even experts who come down to the emergency department, they're outside of their normal area. And that can be stressful too. I think it's unrealistic to hope to be zen calm in these settings. It's much better to think of it as a normal human response to become stressed, but to try and maintain performance for the benefit of the patient. So kind of do things that nudge you towards being able to maintain your performance in that setting. And so the things we teach our trainees, there are some individual techniques that we teach like uh, mental rehearsal. So we break laryngoscopy down into a, a simplified four step technique and get them to just mentally rehearse that while they're pre-oxygenating the patient before intubating. Um, uh, but one of the most effective things I think that we've introduced is this sort of standardization of practice around the checklist. Uh, and so this really helps because there's this really consistent flow of preparation through the, through the pre-brief, the preparatory phases, the pre-oxygenation, and then on to the procedure. I think that really helps with your bandwidth when you're performing the procedure in that by that point, you know you've prepared really well, the patient has kind of been optimised as best as you can, and you also know what will happen next if, if things go awry, if things are more challenging than you anticipated. The other reason I think it's really effective is it gives you to communicate with your team, and that develops this shared, shared mental model and, and shared bandwidth model whereby you've, you've discussed the, all the eventualities and how you're going to prepare and, and how you're going to tailor your um, procedure to the patient in front of you. And I think that's, that's very calming as well, and that's actually what we found is that this is calming, not just for the person holding the laryngoscope, but also for the airway nurse who we, we, have, they, we don't really appreciate how stressful it can be for them as well. So I think this is the checklist and having that standardized process has really reduced uh, the stress levels in the room for these, these events. We're gonna talk a bit more about airway assistants and airway nurses later. Um, so Louise, um, uh, uh, a lot of us saw your airway first presentation on hyperangulated video laryngoscopy. It seems to me that you've really analysed that skill in a way that most airway operators, even experienced ones, haven't done. Um, so this has allowed you to develop your top 10 tips for hyperangulated video laryngoscopy. Can you talk us through the process you went through to get to that expert level and your advice to clinicians who are on the learning curve? Thanks, John. Um, look, I was really fortunate to learn video laryngoscopy from an expert um, from Richard Cooper during my airway fellowship with him. Um, so although you say my tips, um, it's really my interpretation of everything I was taught um, by Richard, um, but, but I am aware that some of the aspects he might teach um, slightly differently now. Look, I come from the, um, you know, the, the, the experience of moving to Canada to do an airway fellowship. I had Richard Cooper standing in the operating room and I hated video laryngoscopy and <laughs> I went out of my way uh, to try and avoid it. So I can absolutely empathise with people who... Uh, are finding particularly hyperangulated blade video laryngoscopy difficult. And I think the turning point for me was 
analysing the difficulties I was having, um, giving those difficulties a name, uh, and then applying the tips that I had been given um, to each of those difficulties. Uh, so, as you mentioned, John, um, I do have um, a few tips that we, that we may be able to show up on screen now. So, the first problem I was having was that I could see the vocal cords, but I couldn't deliver the tube to them. Uh, and you, you can see there a few tips that, um, that Richard gave me that uh, I find um, really useful for overcoming that problem. Uh, and then I'd sometimes have the problem that I could see the cords and I could deliver the tube to them, but then I couldn't get the tube to advance along the trachea. So a different set of tips um, for, for that problem. And then on occasion I was failing even before really I'd started uh, because I couldn't get either the blade or the tube in the mouth. Um, so a couple of tips to overcome that. Um, so I guess my advice for people who are either starting out um, with hyperangulated blade video laryngoscopy or who are finding it as challenging I did at, at the start is to get an expert to show you the tips and tricks, but also how to reduce the risks associated with video laryngoscopy prior to starting um, with a, a hands-on in a very structured way. Um, secondly, record your attempts. Uh, I find that I found this incredibly useful uh, and, and I learned so much from going back to those early, really nauseating uh, attempts um, to use a hyperangulated blade and I picked up things that I would never have noticed in the moment. And my third and final bit of advice is to try and um, consolidate or concentrate your experience as much as possible. So, you know, do something like every Monday's hyperangulated blade day or every intubation for the next three, week, three weeks or maybe, you know, you have hyperangulated blade December. Um, because for me, uh, having that, I, I think I turned the corner at about 30 intubations, but that was over a very uh, short space of time um, because of great access and, and an ability to focus on um, that skill development. Yeah, so you were already a seasoned anaesthetist by the time you went on your fellowship. Um, and it still took you 30 tubes to get what you would call proficient. So for, for those of us occasional airway operators like me, um, it would take a fair amount of time to get 30 tubes under my belt um, as an intensivist. So thanks for that, Louise. That's fascinating. Um, we have got a question about that, but I think we'll come to it later because I just want to make sure we get all our panellists in. Um, so on the subject of intensivists um, using hyperangulated blades, Brewster, um, I've witnessed senior intensivists really struggle with, with hyperangulated video laryngoscopy. Um, so we've all gained access to these devices. You know, I'm sure you, you've got one where you work uh, in your intensive care unit. I think most people have now, um, certainly in this part of the world. Um, it strikes me though that we're not really trained in their use. And for us to rack up 30 tubes like Louise did um, under supervision would be pretty tough. So how do we approach this problem? Yeah, thanks, John. Good question. Um, it is it is interesting when we set up the Beyond Basic uh, airway course, which was really targeting uh, intensive care and emergency department trainees initially back in 2011, I think when we wrote the course, and then it grew um, very quickly. I think it was in about 20 countries by 20, 2015. Um, and the majority of the people attending had moved from sort of young trainees to including even emergency department consultants and some intensivists. What we um, noted when we were teaching a lot of the skills is that many of them were new and video laryngoscopy at the time was actually quite new to the participants from, from those specialties. Obviously, um, through the pandemic now, you'd have to suggest video laryngoscopy is um, no longer a new skill uh, in the ICU. Um, but hyperangulation is probably one the majority of them would stay away from. And, and when we were teaching the skills, what we noticed was we had a, also had a similar technique that you've described where we, we would introduce the theory like Louise had just done in the morning and then have group discussions around real cases to try and get um, the, the learners to make choices from the two or three new skills we'd put in there. So whether it was an awake um, fibre optic or a, a use of video laryngoscopy or an awake tracheostomy and just to make sure they were making the right choice of the patient. And then we'd move to um, a dry lab with mannequins and give them a real, an hour of, you know, one or two learners with, with one or two experts and, and 
the most important thing I think was selecting the best experts to do the teaching. So getting very experienced and experts, as Louise said, to teach the skill and getting them to sit down with the equipment and play around with it uh, and realize the tricks, as Louise mentioned, when you can get a view but you can't quite pass the tube. And after that session, we, we tried to really cement the learning by then putting them in a hot simulation in the afternoon. So giving them three or four simulations to do whereby they should choose one of the new equipments and one of their new skills to use and seeing if they could do it in real time with a you know, hypoxic patient and a SAT probe, you know, making that horrible noise as the SATs drop to 80% uh, to really test out their new skill. Um, I guess in the where we are now, particularly for the consultants out there whose uh, volume of practice is a bit lower, or it certainly was prior to the pandemic, um, one of the most important things I think they can do is stay current with their skills by getting out of the intensive care and getting up into the operating room and doing some intubations and doing it in a safe environment where they have uh, an, an anaesthetist to chaperone them, even if they just do you know, one list every few months that might give them four or five airways to, to put in. And as Louise said, they could make December all about the video laryngoscopy and they should select an appropriate person who has good skills with that device to chaperone them really to, to critique their skills and give them some feedback as they go. Um, one of the interesting points with, with VL for me, I mean, I, obviously I'm, uh, I work in both areas, but I, I do significantly more airway management in anesthesia. Uh, in anesthesia, I probably use VL a lot less because I'm more likely to use an awake fiber optic if I have an airway that I think is difficult. Whereas in intensive care, that, that doesn't seem to happen as much because the patients are either hypoxic or unwell. And so VL is, is used a lot more in the, um, in the high-risk patient. So it is a skill that I think they do need to develop and they really do need to refine because it is one they go to more often um, when they're unsure. That's brilliant. Uh, cheers, David. Um, I, I totally agree with all your points. We're going to come on to kind of access to training opportunities in, what, in the third part of this section, but... One of the things I wanted to highlight, um, which you said was picking, you know, someone with a lot of experience to do the teaching, but more than that, they have to be a good teacher too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, certainly, um, you know, you can tell when, when you ask people, and I know you've had the same experience up in Sydney, when you, you run these courses, and then particularly once you start running them every month, um, like we were prior to the pandemic, and you invite people along and you can tell when they don't really want to be there or if their, their heart's not really in it. Yeah. Um, they might be the world's best anaesthetist, but if they're not that interested in teaching, then it's really a waste of time. Um, so yeah. you really pick people. And, and having that train the trainer sessions where you give them some tips the day before is really helpful just so that, you know, they might they may not have done as much teaching as some of the other faculty members and giving them a little bit of help before they start is, was always really, I, I think was always a really positive thing to do. Thanks very much for that. So, um Nick, are we, are we, have we got questions from the audience or should I've got one more we, question? We do, we do have one there, John. So we've got yeah. a couple coming through now. So Alison Williams, this is probably best for Louise. Um, she's asked, what is reverse loading? This might be a bit challenging to explain without props for it. Uh, okay, so I'll do my very best. Uh, so reverse loading means that you put the stylet in the tube in the way that you ordinarily would but instead of exaggerating the natural curvature of the tube, which is the way that we ordinarily put a stylet into an endotracheal tube, you oppose the natural curvature of the tube. What that, has, what that does is that when that stylet is removed, it allows the tube to essentially unfold a little bit and it, it assists its passage along the trachea. If a tube is loaded in the normal way, when the stylet's removed, it exaggerates that curve and it ends up abutting the anterior tracheal wall, which is one of the reasons why you have that problem that you can get the tube to the cords, but you can't advance it along the trachea. So can I ask you a question, Louise? The, when you're doing reverse loading, which I must say I find not terribly useful, do you do it on a rigid stilet or do you do it on a malleable stilet and then switch it the other way? Because I find on a rigid stilet, the tube wants to slide around and go the other way. Yeah, you look, it's, it's really difficult to do it on a rigid stilet because, because exactly as you said, the tube sort of finds its way back to its, uh, its natural home. Uh, so I tend to usually use a, a disposable malleable stilet uh, because it, it, it allows you to reverse load. Okay, I've got another question here. Um, in, in, in skill development, is there any consideration we should give to resource availability? So there's been some comments here that um, 
you know, people don't often have their video laryngoscope. They don't have universal access in every in every area. If it's saved for the difficult intubation, if they if they used it routinely, they would burn through all their um, disposables, or they might have a reusable device that's then not available when it's genuinely needed for an airway emergency. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, maybe Brewster. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, I mean, you know, I'm all about um, environmental impact of how we practice. So I think that has to come into consideration. Um, but at the same time, you can't expect uh, a clinician to pick up a piece of equipment for the first time um, in the sickest patient or the patient with the most challenging airway. So, um, you know, equipment has to be used for training just as much as it has to be used um, in the situation where it's most needed. And I think this is a, you know, a really interesting discussion that came up in our Intube study about differences in outcomes between patients admitted in intensive care, uh, intubated in intensive care by senior clinicians versus trainees and having a better outcome um, when they were done by senior trainees. And you can potentially put that to Sheila later in the, in the program. But um, the, you know, the, the idea that we shouldn't be doing any training or we should only, you know, be saving the equipment for the actual patient that needs it, I, I think is a little bit narrow-minded. We're going to have to use it. Um, you need to talk to administration about, you know, your usage, maybe get a better deal from some of the reps. Um, you might want to use um, non-disposable equipment in the non-infectious patients. Um, there are ways around it um, that you should explore. Excellent. So I've got another question here. Um, for pre-hospital teams is, is the question that's been asked, but probably applies to everyone. Uh, once, once you're considered experts and you've developed those techniques, particularly for the infrequent intubator, how do you maintain competent, competency, particularly for pre-hospital practitioners? Um, John, do you want to decide who's best to take that? Well, I mean, we are going to come on to that um, a bit later in the program, but um, yeah, Chris, you, you work in pre-hospital care. What, what's, what, uh, and would you regard yourself as a, maybe an, an occasional operator in that field? What, what would your advice be? Yeah, this is a, I think this is a huge issue. So I, I personally use a combination of strategies. Visualization, I think, can be very helpful, both in your downtime, but also during that pre-oxygenation period. Um, I also rely on friends who are anaesthetists and, and try and go to their theater lists if possible. Um, I don't think you need to do it that frequently, but even just a couple of times a year, I think is a good way to um, brush up on your skills and, and just take their tips and tricks, really. That's, uh, that's what I would advise. Uh, and then lastly, there are some great cadaveric courses that are available. And I think there's nothing like um, practicing over and over again uh, under calm conditions when you can really try out all the different tips and tricks calmly uh, on cadavers is a, is a really good way to maintain those skills. So that, that would be my three, three tips. Yeah, and there's a good comment actually that just came in, which is that if you don't have access to cadavers, which are pretty tricky to get hold of, then task trainers... Um, are a good option. They are expensive though, and um, but they, uh, airway equipment companies do have them and they will lend them to you and they'll come and help you run a course. Um, so they're always worth leaning on as that comment made, which was an excellent comment. Okay, I, um, knew, there was, I knew there was a shot here where you could see my legs. This is the big difference between this and other virtual conferences. We've had to wear pants or I have. Uh, John, <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably time for Speak us to, yourself, to, to wrap up. Um, do you, want to, do you want to summarize and, and, um, we'll, and say goodbye to the panel? Yeah. So um, the take-homes uh, for this little session. Um, so for all the skills that we teach, we need to take a step back, break them down, analyze them. We've got to empathize with our learners. Um, and there's some strategies to help them cope with stress. Um, we've heard about some examples of skill analysis. For example, the teaching curve theory and breaking down those um, troubleshooting tips for hyperangulated video laryngoscopy. We've talked about the concept of scaffolded learning, um, of teaching component parts of the skill and then putting them all together at the end. And we're going to come back to that a bit later. Um, we've talked about how we can learn, use that in clinical teaching and also in course design. Um, so I'd like, really like to thank the panel. Um, a couple of them are going to come back later on, um, but thanks for all of your comments and thanks for being with us. Um, and we'll see you, you guys all in the next session. So that was great, John. Um, I, I've just had a thought just talking about that competency question. One, one of the things I've, and I've talked about with this Chris Groombridge in the past, I think one of the real advantages for the occasional intubator um, of hyperangulated video laryngoscopy is that 
as Louise was saying, a lot of the skill with hyperangulated video laryngoscopy is delivering the tube rather than getting the view. With direct laryngoscopy, it's very hard. With direct laryngoscopy, it's the opposite. The problem is getting the view. And it's very hard to practice direct laryngoscopy without access to real tissues, as we said, which means patients or cadavers. There's only so much you can do on tra task trainers. But I think with hyperangulated blades, it's the opposite. That the view is easy to get and getting it on a mannequin or getting it on a patient is pretty much the same thing. It's getting the right view, framing it right, and also delivering the tube. And that skill can be practiced on, um, on a mannequin to almost the same extent as it can be on a real patient. So I think for the occasional, op occasional operator, and I'll declare I have a real bias towards hyperangulated blade, I exclusively use it, but I think there's a real benefit in the occasional operator is that they can practice hyperangulated hyper video laryngoscopy and, and develop the techniques without needing that, that endless, endless access to um, patients, which the comment has been made is difficult for people in intensive care and ED to get consistently. Okay. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, some of the problems of tube delivery are actually exaggerated in mannequins because uh, they're not as slippery as human beings are. And so tube delivery can be even more challenging unless you get it absolutely right with your angle of approach and you get your view completely right. So I agree that's that that kind of second stage of delivering around the secondary curve is is, is really easy to teach with mannequins. OK, um, but we're running 50 seconds behind. I've been told we've got to move on. Um, well, that's not bad. <laughs> That's not bad. So we're going to take a very short break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with more of SAS 2021. See you soon.